I'm going to go over the biogeochemical cycles on our Earth. For reference, this would be found in Chapter 3, Section 4. Some of the objectives you should take away from this screencast is that you should be able to identify and describe the flow of nutrients in each of the biogeochemical cycles. An example of some questions you might be asked might be where does a particular element go at one point in the cycle or to lay out the way that a particular element travels from one place to the next. A big key idea in this entire unit that we've been covering is that matter is never created or destroyed. It is simply rearranged into different compounds. We've seen this when we built Plato atoms and compounds. We've seen this with the cycles of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. We should always keep this main idea in mind throughout this entire unit. If you have two atoms of oxygen at the beginning of a chemical reaction, at the end of the chemical reaction, you're also still going to have two atoms of oxygen present. So matter is never created or destroyed. Those two atoms of oxygen may have begun as an oxygen molecule, such as O2, but then perhaps by the end, those two atoms are part of water, and we have two waters in order to use both of those oxygens. In that chemical reaction, of course, we would have needed to put in hydrogen, and according to our end here, we would have needed to put in four hydrogens. So, again, matter is never created or destroyed. It is simply rearranged. We're also going to make sure that you can explain impacts that humans have on those biogeochemical cycles. We're going to get more into detail during our Human Impacts Unit at the end of this semester. So all atoms, all molecules, all matter cycles through an ecosystem. And it cycles, and during those cycles, energy gets released as the matter recycles. So in this image here to your left, you can see how there is heat being released. So some energy is lost as heat. So let's say, for example, the um, grass here is eaten by the zebra here. Not all of the energy that the grass has will be directly given to the zebra. The plants are going to give off energy as a source of heat as they do the process of cellular respiration. So we can't have a 100% energy transfer because the organism is going to use the energy in order to grow and the organism is going to release some of the energy as heat when it is growing and doing its everyday life processes. So if matter cycles throughout our environment, that means that nutrients cycle. Nutrients recycle through the air, through the land, water, and living things. An example that you're probably very familiar with would be the water cycle. Water is a nutrient that you need. It cycles through the air, the land, the water, and through living organisms. Nutrients are also elements and compounds that organisms need in order to live, grow, and reproduce. Some nutrients that you might be familiar with that your body needs are going to include things like different vitamins as well as um, different compounds that you might need like um, oxygen is uh, a molecule that you're going to need as well. Biogeochemical cycles, what that means is that the bio part means life. The geo part means that it's going to cy cycle through things like soil, rock, water, and air. So geo is the geological part of it. And then chemical means that the atoms are going to break apart and come back together into different compounds throughout the cycles. One important cycle that we're going to learn about is the water cycle. The water 
molecule actually has some very unique properties. First of all, there are some very strong forces of attraction between molecules of water. You may have heard of these and you'll learn more about them when you get into chemistry, but there are um, attra forces of attraction such as polarity, cohesion, and adhesion. And water exists over a very wide range of temperature. For example, from zero degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point of water, to 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point of water. However, the temperature of water changes very slowly. It takes a large amount of energy in order to change the temperature of water. Water also has a unique property that it expands when it freezes. For example, if you were to take and put a water bottle into the freezer and you fill it up this much, the water is going to expand and now the ice might be up to here once it's frozen. So this is an o uh, overview of the water cycle. So with the water cycle, you don't have to memorize every single thing that's in this water cycle, but you should be able to read a diagram like this. And there are some words on this diagram that you might be um, less familiar with. For example, transpiration. Transpiration only happens from plants, and what this process is, is it is releasing water as a gas into the atmosphere from the plants as they are giving, as they are doing the process of photosynthesis. Another word you should be familiar with is the word evaporation. This is where water goes from the liquid state to the gas state. So there's water molecules in our atmosphere and they are as a gas state of matter. Now clouds, you should make sure that you write this down on your notes, clouds happen when a process called condensation occurs. And the process of condensation is when these gas water molecules are going to go back to a liquid state. So when you look up at a cloud, a cloud is actually tiny little water droplets and they're very, very tiny, which is what allows them to float up in the atmosphere. And those tiny little droplets of water make up a cloud. So a cloud is actually liquid. A cloud is not a gas. So by looking at this diagram, you should be able to follow a water molecule. You should be able to see that water runs through the ground. Um, it can run off into the ocean and into rivers. Plants might take up that water, and then through the process of photosynthesis, they will release it back as a gas through the process of transpiration. The water may evaporate from the land. Um, the water may evaporate from the ocean and then it's in the gas state. Once it's up here in the atmosphere in the gas state, it may then condense and turn into clouds and at that point then it can come back down to the land through a process called precipitation. And there's many kinds of precipitation, could be as, a, um, as rain, could be as snow, could be as sleet, could be as hail. There are many ways that human activities actually alter the water cycle. Uh, we drink water, so we withdraw large amounts of fresh water from the ground in aquifers. Um, we also clear vegetation, which means there's going to be less transpiration going and more eroding of soils. We also pollute our water and our underground water sources, um, which then all of these things then can contribute to changes in our climate. And we'll get into more detail on all of these things uh, more towards the end of the semester. So this diagram here is the carbon cycle. Carbon is another element that cycles throughout our planet through many different processes, as you can see in this diagram. 
On your notes, you're going to want to fill in some of the whited out areas. For example, carbon is in the form of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Um, that carbon dioxide gets there through a couple of different processes. It gets there through the process of respiration, which happens um, when we are breaking down our food into energy, as well as plants also releasing that carbon dioxide as well when they do their cellular respiration. Also, uh, humans will release carbon dioxide through um, different factories as well as sometimes this happens naturally with forest fires. Also, carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the water can be released into the atmosphere as well. On the bottom of your notes, you should also fill in um, what respiration is, what photosynthesis is, and what combustion is. You should recognize that respiration releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, so put that in your notes. You should recognize that photosynthesis is going to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Plants do add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, but that's when they're doing this process of respiration. And that combustion is going to be releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So again, you don't have to memorize this whole um, diagram. However, you should be able to read it and understand what it is explaining to you. This diagram shows how carbon changes in our atmosphere. So one thing that you should recognize is that carbon is released and taken in in many different amounts. For example, the ocean actually takes carbon in, but it also releases carbon. But the ocean is considered what is called a carbon sink which means that the more carbon that gets released into our atmosphere, the oceans will actually take carbon in. However, that's bad for the oceans because then, in the oceans, the carbon actually turns into carbonic acid. And that makes the ocean waters more acidic and therefore has a impact on the organisms that live there. So again, you don't have to memorize anything like this, but you should recognize in a diagram that different amounts of carbon are given off by different processes. Different amounts of carbon are taken in. So you should recognize here that photosynthesis takes in more carbon dioxide than the oceans take in. Or you should recognize that plants give off more carbon dioxide than um, deforestation and the use of land. So from the previous diagram you can see that humans alter the carbon cycle in many ways. One of the biggest ways is through our burning of fossil fuels and clearing of vegetation faster than we actually replace it. And so we have seen a large change which the graph here shows that we have seen a very large change in the amount of carbon dioxide emitted from fossil fuels and that's because more factories, more cars, um, is releasing more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Again, we'll get into more details in this when we do our unit on human impacts. This next cycle is the nitrogen cycle. On your notes, you should fill in some of the whited out um, parts of this diagram. For example, in the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, and this might actually surprise you that oxygen gas only makes up about 21% of our gas in our atmosphere, nitrogen actually makes up 78% of the gas in our atmosphere. So the majority of um, what we breathe in is actually nitrogen and your body gets rid of most of it. You should also make sure to fill in this box right here on decomposers. Decomposers use aerobic and anaerobic respiration, which we've learned about. You should also fill in the box right here this is dentrifying bacteria. Um, dentrification or dentrifying bacteria from the arrow, you can see our bacteria that release nitrogen into the atmosphere. So that's dentri dentrification. Um, you should also fill in nitrogen fixing bacteria here in this box on your diagram. 
also called nitrification or nitrifying bacteria, as well as this box right here, which are nitrates. This is the form of nitrogen in the soil. Um, underneath this diagram, you should also fill in what nitrogen-fixing bacteria are. Basically, these are bacteria. You can see the arrow is going down this way. These are bacteria that take nitrogen out of the atmosphere. This diagram shows how humans impact the nitrogen cycle. And you can see that there's a couple of different ways that humans impact the nitrogen cycle. First of all, fertilizers are mostly nitrogen, and so we add nitrogen into the soil, and that goes into the water. Um, we also have uh, large amounts of agriculture that affect the nitrogen cycle. There are also some nitrogen compounds that are released through factories and from car emissions as well. So humans also alter the nitrogen cycle. We add gases that actually contribute to acid rain. When nitrogen and water come together, they create an acid, and that is why it's called acid rain. Um, our farming practices can also add nitrogen to the atmosphere, and nitrogen is actually a heat-absorbing gas. And so when the um, there's more nitrogen in the atmosphere, it's going to warm our atmosphere. Um, it can also deplete our ozone by breaking apart. Ozone is actually an O3 molecule, so it actually takes this O3 molecule and breaks it apart, and that is depleting our ozone. A lot of times we contaminate our groundwater as well with our fertilizers and we also release additional nitrogen into the atmosphere. This is just a layer of our atmosphere by deforestation. And this graph is just a visual for you to see how human activities such as fertilization um, have now added more nitrogen into our soils than all other natural sources combined. So you can see that our natural nitrogen fixation by humans was very low. And then right around the agricultural and industrial revolutions, we started to add those into our soil, and so we've seen a very large increase in the amount of nitrogen in our soils. This is the phosphorus cycle, and in this diagram you should make sure to fill in a couple of boxes that have been whited out, excretion right here, as well as death and decomposition is going to add phosphorus into the land. Phosphorus is one of those nutrients that's necessary for living things in very small amounts. Um, however, it cycles pretty slowly. And there's a couple of different ways that phosphorus can be added into our land. Fertilizer is one um, through our agriculture. It gets added into our food webs. It gets dissolved in the soils. And then it also runs off into the oceans and water. Anytime something dies and decomposes, it's going to release that phosphorus back into the soil or back into the water. So again, you don't have to memorize this cycle. You should simply be able to read and follow the arrows to answer questions about what's happening with the phosphorus. And there's a few different ways that human activities affect the phosphorus cycle. First of all, we do remove large amounts of phosphate from the earth in order to make fertilizers. So that's one of the elements that we use in that. Um, we also reduce phosphorus in our tropical soils by clearing forests. And we will also add extra phosphates to water systems through our runoff of animal waste, um, cow farms and different kinds of animal farms, as well as fertilizers at those farms. Our last cycle is the sulfur cycle. There are a few boxes that you need to fill in on your notes. First of all, when sulfuric trioxide is released into the atmosphere, 
um, it can combine with water to form sulfuric acid and hence acid rain. Um, you should notice that that acid fog and precipitation then affects the plants as well as the animals. That sulfur gets passed to the plants um, and goes back into our soil when those plants or animals die. Um, and industries also can release that hydrogen sulfide, which then bonds with oxygen in the atmosphere and contributes to that chemical that builds the acid rain. So again, you should be making sure to follow, be able to read and follow these diagrams. Some of the ways that human activities affect the sulfur cycle is that we do add sulfur dioxide when we burn coal, coal and oil, as I pointed out in the diagram. Um, we also will take sulfur and convert it into different metals that we might need, such as copper and lead and zinc. Um, and when we do this, we convert and release sulfur dioxide in our atmosphere. Again, you don't have to memorize all of these cycles. You just have to make sure that you can read the diagrams and you understand the vocabulary that's in them. We're not going to go over this. Um, however, it might be something that you want to look into when we get into human impacts.